Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, CI202. Welcome to unit number eight on digital citizenship. I'm very happy to be here with my longtime friend and acquaintance and professional teacher, uh, uh, Andrew Roy. Um, Andrew has been a middle school teacher for the past 13 years um, up in Minnesota, and he will be joining us to share um, his experience and examples of digital citizenship in the middle school classroom. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Um, so in CI202, we think about digital citizenship as um, having two important parts. Um, so for us, we think about um, respectful behavior online, um, so how we can teach our students to um, be respectful, to be um, to use respectful discourse and appropriate language um, to make smart, reasonable, and deliberate choices. And we also teach our students how to be engaged online in um, civic engagement. So things that would benefit their community. Um, so for us, those two components are very important. Is that similar um, to how you're thinking about digital citizenship in the middle school classroom. Absolutely. Um, it, I mean, it's an evolving target always in a, in a live middle school. Um, we spend time having the sort of theoretical discussions like, and this is one of those, which is great for me. Um, and uh, to sort of ground ourselves in the theory and, and our thinking. Uh, and then there's the practical day-to-day -day realities of trying to teach all the different content and get all the different teachers on board. Uh, and I have all of us hitting the mark. Um, but I like that, that division between respectful conduct and then civic engagement. That's wonderful. Um, the only element I, I would add on our end is we, we do think about uh, students being savvy consumers of um, social media content. Uh, so thinking about all of the, uh, we talk a little bit with students about clickbait. We talk about um, uh, you know, fake news. Uh, how do you uh, ascertain the veracity of information? Uh, what kinds of things are likely to be uh, exaggerated um, and and the dangers sort of of depending solely on social media for news content and things like that. Um, so uh, I, I'm, uh, I think that probably fits primarily in the civic engagement angle because in order to be civically engaged, you need to be able to sort of process the information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are, those are really good points. So, so in the news media, and the popular media, you know, things like Newsweek, Time, New York Times, etc. We see a lot of sensationalized stories about youth being uh, um, sort of taken in by mm -hmm. sensational stories, or um, or you know, not having the skills or awareness to make proper choices. Um, so that's on the one hand, and on mm -hmm. the, uh, the other hand is the argument that. Students are digital natives. They don't need any help because they're so proficient. Where do you, th where, where does your experience um, kind of lie with those two perspectives? Well, I, I love that. And we talk about that very explicitly in class. And I think both of those perspectives ultimately are, are uh, you know, exaggerations and, and false to, to a large degree. To, you know, they don't describe any individual student that you find. Uh, I, I find that students are both um, more savvy uh, at times than, than uh, perhaps the adult world gives them credit for, um, but also far less savvy. Um, so this idea that they are um, sort of, yeah, the digital native idea that every student uh, sort of naturally has figured out all the angles, um, it, it, I find that at times it's a surprisingly shallow. They know how to achieve the things that they need to achieve. For, for whatever social benefit or, or the games they want to do or getting their homework done or whatever it is. Um, beyond that, they have a, a surprisingly little understanding, right, of the nature of uh, the internet, of how the technologies that are curating the information that the Facebook feeds are giving them or, you know, Facebook's fairly passe with middle schoolers these days, but, you know, for, uh, you know, how, how, how Twitter functions and how things get ranked and all of that kind of stuff, they uh, often have very little understanding of. Uh, but at the same time, they, like if I mentioned clickbait in class, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And they can provide dozens of examples of headlines they've seen that are, are, um, are, are that sort of uh, thing. And uh, so there's a mix there 
And one of the joys I think of working with, you know, actual live middle schoolers is, <laughs> is, um, is figuring out with them sort of where they lie in that and helping them sort of expand their horizons, making them perhaps a little bit aware that there's, there is ignorance there uh, too. Um, but also honoring the fact that they are knowledgeable in within the spheres that they have. And so, um, um, yeah, I, I, I really like that analogy. It almost seems to me that we could say uh, middle school students may be very tactical, um, mm -hmm. but they may not be very strategic. So they can understand how to do very specific things and they're very good at those things, but they're still developing their competencies of critique, um, maybe of analysis of, of the kind of long-term, long-range thinking about why it's so important. How would you answer the question, why it's so important to teach um, digital citizenship for your students? Okay, that's such, it's almost such a bedrock, you know, it's one of those things that feels totally obvious, and then when you try to define it, it's harder. Um, social media uh, and digital technology, the internet, computers, uh, you know, Wikipedia, all of these uh, things that are out there are unbelievably empowering uh, in terms of education. I mean, we don't even, we don't use textbooks in social studies in our middle school program anymore because why would we do that when I, I, I can pull an article from the Atlantic and I can pull an article from the newspaper and I can pull videos uh, and, and every year it's fresh and every year it's different and I pull the latest stuff. So it's amazingly valuable. Uh, at the same time, hearkening back to what we were talking about, about that, that tactical, I love that um, piece. The, the students are tactical, but not strategic. They can only understand the experiences that they've had. They, they don't have the big picture yet. And that's been true, obviously, throughout history. But with the technology, it's particular. There's so much information available to them. Uh, and so much of it is questionable or biased or false or misleading. Uh, and, and enabling them to have those filters uh, is incredibly important. So that's one thing as a consumer of information, simply mm -hmm. like to help them deal with the fire hose. Um, and, uh, but then on the other hand, uh, as we all know in the adult world, right, behaviors on the internet are um, uh, not up to the standards that we would expect for face-to-face -face communication, right? There's lots of bad stuff that happens there, whether it's bullying or, or a nasty sort of hate speech or all that sort of thing. And so enabling students to to understand that, first of all, what they put out there on the internet in some ways is gonna persist. So that whole idea of digital footprints they're leaving behind, um, that's huge and students don't get that because they're, they're young and they, don't, they can't imagine uh, an employer. Um, so they're so far in eighth grade from being employed in a permanent you know, career kind of situation. The idea that an employer is gonna Google them and find out all this crazy stuff that they posted when they were in eighth grade seems hard to believe. Uh, and so that's an important piece that the, the, foots, the footprints um, that, that they're starting to create a persona online and that they're not as anonymous as they think they are sometimes when they're using a fake account or whatever, um, that these things can be linked. Uh, but then also, I mean, a, a larger picture there is not just about personal consequences. It's about what kind of society do we want? Um, and if, if the online world is part of our society, and thinking society you know, larger than just the United States, right? The global society. Um, how can we contribute to making that a better place? Um, and that's a big question for students to think about. Uh, is, 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 are these actions that I'm taking, are these posts, is this interchange that I'm having, um, is this making the world more like the kind of place I want it to be? Wow, and that's a huge question. And and so I'm, I'm sure that um, there are ways that you're able to break down that question into smaller, more meaningful chunks. And I happen to know that you have a, a particular reading strategy that you can help us with um, that will share an example of, of what you're talking about. So we have about five and a half minutes left. So why don't you go ahead and um, share your screen so you can show us. Um, okay, there you go. All right, there was a, there was a little uh, uh, internet glitch there. Okay, so um, 
This is a strategy called lateral reading um, that I uh, got uh, from a paper that I read by Sam Weinberg and one of his graduate students uh, over at Stanford. And uh, this is the idea that actual fact checkers on the internet um, don't do some of the things that teachers like me used to teach. So we used to, it was like, when you find a website, if you don't know what it is, go to the about page, check out the funders and kind of do all this deep research into the site. But there's so many fake sites now that are spoofing even those pages uh, that that actually takes a long time to pull off. And you need a lot of background knowledge that students don't necessarily have. Mm. So one of the first things fact checkers now do is this idea of lateral reading, where when you open a site and you don't know uh, what it is, you don't recognize it, you immediately open a new tab and Google for information about that site. Um, you can go beyond Google, of course, and start and use sites that you've vetted in the past that know things about other sites. So for example, Snopes uh, and uh, factcheck.org and places like that. Um, and so this idea of lateral reading is a faster way to quickly identify, is this a legitimate source or not? Um, and so, uh, we tried that with our students this year and we, we gave them a homework assignment. I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, so I'm bringing up my other screen here. So you should be able to see here a Google document um, that we use uh, that was a, a homework assignment. So students received this digitally uh, and it asked them to use lateral reading and other appropriate strategies to determine which of the following two websites is likely to be more reliable. And I actually chose these two websites from uh, the Weinberg article. These are the two that he used with his students in, um, in uh, graduate school. Um, and then I remind them what lateral reading is, is when you check other trusted websites and find information about our organization. We'd spent probably a 10 minute or 15 minute mini lesson in class about that uh, before the homework assignment. And then site one is the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, site two, the American College of Pediatricians. And then down here, they pick their winner they describe what strategies they use, like what did they do, um, what steps did they take, and then their analysis down at the bottom, which is like, you know, a paragraph explaining why they came up with uh, one choice over the other. And we found that 90 to 95% of the students um, uh, got it right, actually, um, and which is, uh, you know, more than 50% got it wrong in the experiment that Weinberg did. And I believe that's because, um, they were just told to evaluate uh, and they use strategies that don't get you to the right answer quickly enough. Um, so I found that very compelling this year. Uh, this is the first time we've tried it. We'll be doing that every year from now on uh, to help students uh, rapidly identify um, potential bias in websites. Excellent. <laughs> I love that idea. I'm sorry, we're having some internet issues right now on our site. Um, I love that idea of the mini lesson, which is teaching students a very appropriate um, skill or strategy, and then um, actually going to um, two websites that look very similar, and I'm sure that um, the students don't know either of them. And so um, that uh, kind of mimics a, a real life situation where maybe they've heard of something, but they lack the background knowledge, as you said. Um, so I really like that idea. Um, Andrew, what, what would you suggest? Um, do you see anything? Um, actually, let me back up. Um, can you spend about the last minute um, just talking about uh, how your middle school strategy for developing digital citizenship um, maybe lines up with what you do at the high school level? So how does it tie in with um, kind of developing competence? Well, interestingly, in our middle school, we don't allow uh, cell phones in the classrooms. They have to sort of lock them and turn them off and put them in their lockers every morning. Uh, and they generally do that. Uh, and what we see ourselves doing in the middle school is developing the habits and the, um, yeah, I think developing those habits of respectful use of technology. When they get to ninth grade, uh, suddenly those cell phone restrictions are off. They're allowed to use social media in the hallways or, you know, in classrooms if teachers allow it. Um, and uh, the idea there is the middle school time, we're setting up those developmental realities, uh, getting them prepared for that enhanced freedom in their lives. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm sure we could spend um, the next half an hour to an hour talking about digital citizenship, um, but I wanna thank you so much um, for your experience, Andrew, um, as well as sharing 
your uh, um, uh, Google Doc with us. Um, that was great. So thank you, Andrew. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure being part of this. Okay, thank you.